Thank you. Thank you all for coming up. I'm, I'm sorry for the confusion. I should have done more cutting and pasting last night. <laughs> I'm not sure I know what that is, but it sounds like a good thing to do. Um, this is this is personal to me because um, Eric House a lot of butt South Portland. I'm a Cape Elizabeth resident, but I have a lot of empathy with my South Portland neighbors, and I've become personally engaged in this campaign. I'm committed to win, and uh, it's really important to me. I've phone banked, I've gone knocking on doors, um, I've spoken, written letters, and. Um, this is this is these are my these are my buddies up here. So uh, I'm very happy to get this citation. As part of our ongoing work to combat climate change, NRCM has been working for several years to stop disastrous climate change and other environmental impacts from tar sands. Full extraction of tar sands has been called game over for a healthy climate. The risks to Maine are tremendous. Should oil giants succeed? at getting the okay for tar sands to move through Maine. Perhaps no one is more aware of this than the people who live in the towns along the pipeline route. Currently, seven main towns along the route of the Portland-Montreal pipeline have passed local resolutions stating their town's opposition to sending tar sands through the 63-year-old pipeline. At this point, I'm supposed to ask you to come up on stage, but... <laughs> I didn't write this script, so <laughs> welcome. The passage of the town's resolutions represent an important chapter in the ongoing effort to keep tar sands out of Maine, and they have garnered attention regionally and nationally, including by elected officials at all levels. NRCM worked closely for more than a year with the residents of Casco. Casco? Waterford, <laughs> Harrison, <laughs> and Otisfield. <laughs> the people here before you worked incredibly hard together to educate themselves and their neighbors, collect signatures to put resolutions on the town meeting agendas, and to build community and awareness and support. Their hard work and dedication to protect their hometowns and drinking water for most people in the auditorium. From Tar Sands, from Tar Sands deserves our recognition and our thanks. In addition, we recognize the ongoing tireless efforts by the citizens of South Portland, Pass an ordinance that would protect our city from the threats of dirty tar sands export facility. Today we thank you and we present you all the 2013 Environmental Award. Thank you. So, we would like to invite a representative from each of your towns to make a brief presentation. Uh, <laughs> Waterford. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm honored to accept this award on behalf of the Waterford group that came together, as Tony said, for their passion and commitment to the environment, um, which eventually uh, put forth the resolution to prevent tar sands oil from being pumped through Waterford via the Portland Montreal pipeline. Waterford is probably the most critical place um, in New England or in Maine of all of the states because in the country, thank you, John, in the country because of how it crosses back and forth over Crooked River or Crooked River over the pipeline. I'd like to thank NRCM for holding the initial inform informational meeting that they did at our town library. And I would like to acknowledge and give deep gratitude to our core group that came together out of that meeting. Ray Holm, Earl Morse, Bart Hagg, who's here today, Jim Kearney, and myself. Along with the help of Randy Lassar, Chris Easton here today, Charlie and Antoinette Tarbell, 
John Howe here today, his wife Debbie, Carolyn Stan Rothenberg, Carol Rice, Marianne Holm, and Geraldine. Our goal was to give everyone an opportunity to become informed about tar sands oil, the risks as well as the minor benefits. We created an education process. One was a website that had resources, scientific information. Um, the resolution was posted on it and a what you can do page. We had several public events with audio visual presentations followed by question and answers. We had an information booth at our local Waterford annual fall <coughs> foliage road race. We met face to face with community groups and local businesses. We created a mailing to all Waterford residents, a poster board collage of the tar sands disastrous spill in Kalamazoo and said this happened in Kalamazoo and this could be you. And, we, and the people that spoke at town meeting. Um, special thanks to Lee Dassler of Western Maine Foothills Land Trust, also from Otisfield, Dylan Borges of NRCM, and Todd Martin of NRCM for being major supports. Because through these efforts, our resolution passed at our town meeting in March. Because people saw the value in protecting their health, the quality of life, their land values, water and air quality, and the economy and the precious resource of the Crooked River for tourism and sportsmanship. And it protected us from the enormous and unacceptable risks and irreversible damage that could be caused by the pipeline with little or no benefits. Thank you very much to everyone in these efforts. This is very crucial to all of us. representing the Western Foothills Land Trust, and I'm also representing myself as a resident of Bolsters Mills with the pipeline right in my um, backyard, basically. And I want to thank the Natural Resource Conservation uh, Council of Maine for recognizing all the good work that this Valiant crew has done, and I know it will lead us to success on November 5th, when the South Portland Ordinance is going to pass. <laughs> Bennett, who's right there. So this goes back many, many years. The land trust community has been really working to protect the Crooked River watershed, um, not only for our fishing benefits and our recreational benefits um, and our, just the scenic beauty of our towns in the upper, upper headwaters, but also to protect the drinking water for the greater Portland community. Um, one of the threats on the river has been a uh, proposed dam of the Crooked River that goes back, how long, Nick? Uh, 10 years? 14 years? Yeah, yeah, probably actually back to the 70s. It was sometime when the Republicans and the Democrats were talking to each other in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> was way and that's where I first met Nick. We would show up in, Wash in Augusta to um, combat, try to combat this proposed dam, and there was Nick. And there was the Natural Resource Council of Maine, fighting for our communities, fighting for our river um, doggedly, years and years ago. So when I get a call from someone on the, um, uh, Todd Martin, actually, on the Natural Resource Council, to come and help with this tar sands issue, we were there. So this is just, it's just an example of how the Maine community works together. We help each other, whatever the threat is, we work together on a statewide level and on a local level. So that's all I want to say for Otis Field. Thank you all. Casco? Thank you so much. I'm Eric Dibner. I'm chair of the Open Space Commission in the town of Casco. Uh, I want to recognize the people who are here from Casco, 
uh, Big Billy, Jackie Wurzman, um, Chair of our Board of Select Persons, Mary Vanessa Fernandez, and uh, Connie Cross. Uh, these are not all the activists in town who worked on our uh, uh, resolution, but um, the tip of the iceberg, I guess you'd say. And we did have a large turnout from Casco to support uh, this effort. The uh, credit, though, goes to NRCM for bringing to our attention the importance of this work to try to stop tar sands in our area. Uh, without NRCM's leadership, we wouldn't have known where to go. But as you can see, we are a string of towns that are connected by this pipe, and it all flows downhill, as we say, and ends in South Portland if it gets reversed. So we're now all connected as a, a, a chain of activists in the region that is affected by this environmental threat. When the issue was brought to the town of Casco's attention, um, I guess the call I got was from Toth, and there were uh, several workshops in town. We went the route of putting this before the voters as a resolution at town meeting. The Board of Select Persons felt it was important that the whole town be involved in the question of what our opinion was. So our resolution was passed at town meeting, and that was a project that took a lot of organizing and, uh, and public information. But uh, we think that has been very helpful, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm recalling one thing that uh, a former member of our board of select person said, Barbara York, that we did this work because it had to be done. We were the first one. Yeah, our town is yes. <laughs> We didn't do it for recognition. We didn't do it to be here today. We did it because someone had to do it, and we were called upon, and we circulated petitions. We uh, talked to people. But we never expected this kind of recognition. And when a group like NRCM comes forward and recognizes citizens for uh, what we had to do, uh, that makes us feel good, and we appreciate that as their leadership uh, helps us all. So thank you very much. Harrison. Um, I live in Bolsters Mills also, but on the Harrison uh, side of the Crooked River. Um, with the Crooked River out back, uh, I have in the front yard the pipeline. Uh, not only is my home there, but uh, my two uh, businesses, uh, the Pennsylvania Growing Company and the uh, USDA Aquaculture Facility, is also located there. Needless to say, uh, should something happen with the pipeline there, my home and my business and livelihood would be devastated. Uh, and after having learned um, through uh, education from the NRCM uh, exactly what tar sands involves, uh, I decided to join with uh, my fellow Harrisonians uh, to work to first uh, get a resolution uh, uh, put on the town warrant and then uh, get the resolution passed <clears throat> at, a, at the uh, uh, election in the summer. <clears throat> uh, without the NRCM's uh, help, especially that from uh, Todd Martin and Dylan Voorhees, we would have had a very uh, tough road to hope. Uh, their uh, material support as well as their physical presence uh, in town when we uh, were trying to educate uh, uh, the townspeople about the issue of tar sands was absolutely essential for our resolution uh, to get passed. <clears throat> um, lastly, I want to thank my fellow Harrisonians, uh, not only those who supported the resolution, 
but those on the other side of the of the debate. Um, I'm very proud of them because they carried on a civil discourse on this issue without acrimony and with mutual respect. And that sort of interaction is something we could use a whole lot more of down in you know where. <clears throat> Thank you all very much. Well, congratulations to um, you pipeline communities. Um, congratulations on getting your resolutions passed. Um, South Portland, someone like to. Thank you. I'm going to read mine. Basically, it's the story of what we've done. First, let me say how very much I appreciate this honor of being bestowed on our group um, called Protect South Portland. Unfortunately, many of them could not be here because they have full-time jobs in addition to their volunteer efforts. I'd like to give you some background as to how South Portland got, how Protect South Portland got started. In the fall of 2012, environmentalist activist Bill McKibben, founder of the Grassroots 350, brought his national Do the Math tour to the State Theatre in Portland. He warned about tar sands potential contribution to global climate crisis. If all the tar sands are mined, it's game over for the planet, he said. Being extremely concerned about the future of life on Earth, I heard this warning, warning loudly and clearly. In February, through Elders for Future Generations, a group comprising members of OSHA, Lifelong Learning Institute, here at USM, I learned more about the horrors of tar sands mining in Alberta, Canada. There, it's destroying the ecosystem of boreal forests, one of the last wild forests left in the world. Vast acres are being torn up by bulldozers to get, the, to get at the tar sands, leaving behind pools of toxic waste. People are dying of cancer because the, because the air and drinking water are toxic. But the tar sands also carries a threat much closer to home. The Portland Pipeline Corp, based in South Portland, but majority owned by ExxonMobil, would like to bring Canadian tar sands through New England for, for export out of South Portland. This would mean reversing the flow of a 62-year-old pipeline that has been used to send oil from tankers to Montreal, forcing a heavy tar sand substance through the pipe requires thinning it with benzene, which would then be burned off in South Portland before export the tar sand, before exporting the tar sands abroad. All up and down New England, people were protesting the prospect of tar sands coming through their communities, citing disastrous spills elsewhere in the country. But only the federal government can control what flows through pipelines. Right, I wondered, could South Portland refuse to allow the tar sands? I decided to see what I could do. I called the mayor, Tom Blake. He informed me that in 2008, the city had granted Portland Pipeline a permit for tar sands export from Pier 2 near Bud Light. It, it would allow construction of two 70-foot stacks and a new pumping station. This permit, had been allowed to this permit had been allowed to lapse because the price of oil was too low. But with higher oil prices, the company was eager to renew the permit. Mayor Blake, Mayor Blake scheduled a public workshop on March 11, 2013 to debate the pros and cons of Tar Sands project. It was clear what I had to do. I rounded up three helpers and we con contacted as many South Portland organizations as we could about the event. Um, the Natural Resources Council of Maine, Environment Maine, and 350 also pitched in. To our amazement, about 400 people showed up, filling the gym at the community center. After presentations from both pipeline and environmentalists, Dylan, of course, 50 people lined up to speak individually about protecting their community from the risks of 
air and water pollution and preserving the quality of life in this beautiful place. Many were deeply concerned about what adding a fuel to our carbon footprint that is even dirtier than coal could mean. Heartened by this turnout, about a dozen of us started to, to started in earnest to organize meeting in my living room. We eventually realized that the only way to pre prevent tar sands being exported from our waterfront was to create an ordinance prohibiting the, ne the necessary infrastructure. Drafted by a local retired lawyer, Natalie West, it was named the Waterfront Protection Ordinance. To bring it to the ballot, we needed to collect 935 signatures. In just 11 days, through a, an enormous effort and the help of 125 volunteers, we collected 3,779 signatures. The last two um, being written by, the, my, by Mayor Blake and his wife. After another public hearing this fall, the South Portland City Council voted to put the ordinance before the people on November 5th ballot. That put a PSP team into high gear. Every week, hundreds of volunteers are, volunteer, are volunteered in canvassing door-to-door -door and running a phone bank. Our campaign is going well and we're finding we have loads of grassroots support. But this is truly a David and Goliath situation. While we have the people power and the passion, the oil industry has the money, gobs and gobs of it. They are throwing everything they can at us, using scare tactics and untruths in an attempt to sway voters. Our ongoing job is to make sure South Portland residents go to the polls with all the facts. Packaging information and getting into voters' hands has been a huge undertaking. At this critical stage and throughout the entire process from the first public hearing right up to now, we have had tremendous support from NRCM, Environment May, 350 and Toxics Action, for which we are most grateful. We truly could not have done this, gone this far without you. Thank you. All right, team, you're excused. Practice will begin tomorrow. <laughs> We're not done yet, November 5th. Thank you all very much.